Hi everyone, my name is Kevin Griffin. I'm a co-director co of the undergraduate program in sustainable development. And I have the pleasure of introducing our speakers today from the Capstone Workshop uh, uh, program. And this is a group of students, uh, a group of seniors mostly. Are you all seniors? Yeah. yeah. This is a group of seniors who have uh, been working in the sustainable development program. And here during the, their uh, final semester, they're trying to bring together the various ideas that they've learned to problem solve and problem solve for a client. So the client came to us with an issue that they wanted advice and recommendations and uh, solutions to. And this uh, client was Rockland County, the Rockland County Commissioner. And the uh, project has grown out of a previous project which started to look at water conservation in Rockland County. And this semester, these particular students have been looking into the future and looking at climate change. And as uh, many of you know, Rockland County, like many of the areas around here, uh, suffered a lot of damage during uh, Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane Irene. And so the issue of how to prepare for this and deal with this and mitigate are issues that I think we're going to hear about today. So without further ado, I will turn it over to our students to uh, make the presentation on their findings for the Capstone Workshop um, project. And I'd also like to say that this is a great dry run because they will be presenting their results to the Rockland County Commissioner next week, which uh, will be a really exciting time. So without further ado, I'll turn it over. Hi, um, so our project title is Storm Damage, Climate Change, and Adaptation in Rockland County. Um, yeah, so we, um, he gave a pretty good explanation of what the purpose is. Um, and so yeah, we're helping the client with um, uh, by applying our knowledge of sustainable development. Um, so this is Rockland County. Um, we're specifically going to be touching upon a lot of Stony Point, Hopper Straw, Niagara, We go through. So our clients are um, our, our main client is actually going to be is Thomas um, B. Vanderbeek, who is the commissioner of planning in Rockland, and um, and then also there he brought in Christopher um, Jensen, who is um, he's the program coordinator for um, um, emergency services, and so um, we've been working with them and trying to identify these. Um, you know, areas of vulnerability and areas where they can make improvements um, in their planning. So the project objective is um, to make policy changes, actually, and we're going to base these on the considerations of the impacts of Sandy and Irene, which were two very big storms who hit Rockland County specifically. Um, the next step then was we projected the effects of extreme weather um, based on a range of climate outcomes. And then finally, we did an analysis of Rockland's current efforts towards mitigation and adaptation. We looked into um, their budget and um, just hazard mitigation plan in general. Um, we're only going to go into pretty general recommendations because of the time constraint. Um, but if you'd like to read our report, we go into a lot more specifics. The approach that we're taking is, uh, is doing, you know, we started off with the impact assessment, looking at what happened before in these past two storms. Um, and just, you know, we got to kind of determine what the vulnerabilities are that are specific to Rockland. And then we've also been able to um, uh, look at future projections. So um, some of our some members of our team have, have worked with, um, at NASA Goddard, with the people at NASA Goddard who had um, pro projections on uh, climate change that they were able to get downscaled to Rockland. So that way they can, we can provide the client with specific um, information about how you know temperatures and precipitation are going to change. Um, another thing, that, and also we've done on for hydrological issues, um, as far as like storm surge and sea level rise, um, and then we make policy recommendations based on those findings. And then before we get started with the actual information, um, I'd like to introduce ourselves. I'm Maggie, um, and this is Rob. We are the project managers. The GIS, which is a mapping program, if you're not aware of it, um, is Jesse. And so he'll be showing um, maps of what we found. Then we had the policy task leader and the storm impact analysis, which is Pat. Then we did economic impacts, and that was primarily Joe. 
and then hydrological projections Kathy was in charge of, and then we had the beautiful climate projections group of Rebecca and Rose. Okay, so just to start out, we're going to uh, take a brief look at some of the meteorological characteristics of the two storms because that uh, was a big determinant of uh, the types of damage that were sustained in Rockland County uh, in both cases. Uh, and so one, one of the most important things to note, uh, first of all, is that the trajectory of the storms was quite different in terms of where they hit uh, New York State. Uh, and so Irene actually passed uh, much more directly over the lower Hudson, Hudson River Valley, and so much closer to Rockland County uh, when compared to Sandy. Uh, also, the, uh, the strength of the storms uh, was, was a little bit different. Uh, the, the winds uh, during, during Sandy were much higher than Irene, uh, and the winds, uh, as we're going to talk about, are particularly important because of tree fall, downed power lines, uh, those kinds of impacts. In terms of the largest sources of damage uh, from the two storms, uh, Hurricane Irene uh, primarily impacted Rockland through inland flooding because there was very heavy precipitation, uh, which led to a lot of flooding on uh, several rivers that we're going to mention, uh, which overflowed their banks and, and caused property damage. Whereas in Hurricane Sandy, uh, the primary source of damage was coastal uh, and was due to storm surge along the Hudson River. Um, and so, so again, a key, a key the two key differences that I would highlight are one, the trajectory of the storm, and two, the amount of precipitation. Um, and then also it's worth noting that, uh, that Sandy stayed in the region longer when compared to Irene, which has some, Im uh, has some consequences when you're thinking about disaster response. Um, okay, so I'm going to be focusing a little bit on the inland flooding aspect, which was most pertinent in Hurricane Irene, and then uh, I'm going to turn it over to Jesse afterward, who will talk about storm surge, which was more important uh, during Hurricane Sandy. And so the areas where the inland flooding damage were, uh, was most extensive in Rockland County were uh, in, the, in the southern and western uh, area of the county where the precipitation was heaviest. That's also where the larger rivers are. Um, and so of, of the major rivers in the county, which we're going to look at, uh, the Ramapo and the Mawa rivers both uh, experienced the higher, highest level of flooding ever, um, and the Hackensack also uh, reached its second highest level. In terms of impacts, uh, as I already mentioned some of the wind impacts in terms of fallen trees, uh, but the, the flooding compounds that because when, uh, when the soil is saturated from heavy precipitation, that means it's easier for trees to fall. Uh, but there were also uh, many damages in terms of, uh, in terms of transport uh, because a number of bridges in the county were washed out, some roads were flooded, and also uh, one of the Metro North rail lines was flooded out. Um, so here is a photo of uh, West Nyack following Hurricane Irene. This is a street near the Hackensack River uh, in the town of, uh, uh, again, in the town of West Nyack. And uh, we're going we're gonna to look in a moment at what happened here. Here are the four U.S. Geological Survey stream gauges which are currently active in Rockland County. We can see there's two on the Ramapo River, one on the Mawa, and one on the Hackensack River. That photo you just saw of the flooded street was taken near the Hackensack stream gauge, which is just downstream of that large oblong body of water, which is Lake DeForest, which is a reservoir that flooded as a result of heavy precipitation during Irene. So here we can see the uh, readouts from the four stream gauges. Uh, and in all four cases, we can see uh, Hurricane Irene is the tallest bar there. Uh, the red line, which we see on, on three of the charts, indicates the level that's considered to be a flood, flood stage. So if the water stage, if the water level reaches above that, uh, then it's a flood. Um, and the consequences of this were uh, pretty dramatic in, in a few areas. So we see here a map at the countywide level, which was in Rockland County's uh, hazard mitigation plan from a few years back before the storm. Uh, and the yellow dots indicate properties that have been repeatedly damaged by flooding. Um, and what we see, in fact, is that uh, there is a recurring pattern of uh, certain properties being damaged very frequently. Uh, typically, they're located you know, immediately adjacent to rivers in low-lying areas in, you know, wetlands, et cetera. I should also note the red areas there are the, uh, are the highest risk uh, 
uh, flood areas. And it's a little bizarre because actual bodies of water are indicated as flood areas as well. But uh, so of the three of the three blue rectangles there, uh, then I'm going to mention a few details about the one on the far left, which is uh, on the Mawa River in the town of Suffern, and the one on the far right, which is where we saw the photograph on the Hackensack River. Um, and oh, I guess that's all we have there for slides. Uh, so just a, uh, uh, a, few, a few points about the, the flooding location on the Mawa River. Uh, there were four homes there which were uh, severely damaged by the storm because uh, the, uh, the water levels surpassed the banks of the Mawa River, flooded out basements, washed out foundations. Um, and so four houses there after the storm uh, were uninhabitable, uh, had to be demolished, um, and that land area was, uh, was bought out. Uh, by the town uh, and is now being allowed to revegetate. And then the other location which we, where we saw the photo on the Hackensack River, uh, because of the flooding uh, in the Lake the Forest Reservoir, which uh, then led to overflow of the banks of the Hackensack River, there were a number of homes there uh, where the basements were also flooded uh, and caused extensive damage. Um, so with that, I'll turn over to Jesse, who's going to talk about storm surge. Okay, first, uh, storm surge differs from inland flooding because it is um, the result of a hurricane or tropical storm along the coast that uh, drives coastal waters above normal levels and onto dry land. So the difference is, you can see here, it's the distance above the normal um, high tide. So the impacts from uh, the storm surge for Irene were relatively minor. Uh, as Pat said, it was mostly inland flooding. Um, and it was pretty consistent with what a Hurricane 1 projection would be for storm surge, although it did uh, inundate some of the 100-year FEMA flood areas. Um, for Hurricane Sandy, uh, it was much more extensive. It covered about twice the flooded area and inundated almost all of the 100-year FEMA um, flood areas along the coast. Um, and this was due to a combination of not just the hurricane, but also it coincided with a very high tide and another uh, storm that um, caused more uh, flooding. So here we can see the blue areas. Irene is on the left and Sandy is on the right. The blue areas represent the areas that were flooded, and the dashed lines are the 100-year, and the kind of dotted lines are the 500-year FEMA flood areas. So as you can see, um, the flooding from Sandy was much more extensive and filled in a lot of um, areas. This is Piermont, the town of Piermont. So this is, um, it inundated much more of the town than Hurricane Irene did. And we can see this is um, from the hazard mitigation plan from 2010 that the county produced. And we can see that um, these are the projected areas of storm surge for uh, different categories of hurricanes. So green is uh, category one, yellow category two, orange is three, and red is four. And as we can see, despite uh, Sandy being just a category one hurricane, and it was a tropical storm by the time it got to Rockland, um, the storm surge still inundated a lot of areas that were uh, projected for a Category 3 hurricane. Um, and we can see that along other parts of the bank also. This is um, a photograph of this Nyack after Hurricane Sand. You get kind of a sense of what the storm surge can do. And again, um, along Sony Point and Haverstraw, we see the same kinds of things where the, um, for Sandy, the storm surge extent was much greater than what would be expected for a, hurricane, a Category 1 hurricane. Yeah, just going real quickly into the damages uh, experienced by each storm. On the low end, we'll see uh, 20, around 26 million from Hurricane Irene. That's from uh, local government estimates and, and publicly available resources, uh, but excludes private insurance and, and unrecovered claims. Uh, it's about 18 million damages uh, to public resources and, and 9 million in damages to O&R, which is the local utility. Uh, and a day after the storm for Irene, there was around 20, 000, 29,000 customers still without power in Rockland. 
Uh, comparatively, Sandy uh, happened much more recently, and, and official uh, estimates are not released yet. But uh, you know, judging by the, the three days after the storm, uh, 75,000 customers, 67 percent of, of Rockland customers were still without power. Uh, we can figure that the, their, the damages recorded from Sandy would be uh, on the higher level than uh, Irene. So due to the fact that a majority of the um, power outages during the storms were due to tree fall uh, falling on the power lines, we looked a little bit into what the major causes were for tree fall and uh, what the frequency was and how we can mitigate these events in the future. There wasn't too much site-specific uh, information with regards to tree fall in Rockland County, but doing some research we found that there were a couple, or there are a couple common factors that tend to cause tree fall, including soil type, tree type, uh, soil waterlogging, as Pat mentioned, uh, more vulnerable areas are closer to areas of water buildup, such as on the banks of rivers or on roads that have poor drainage systems. Um, so in the future, it could be helpful for Rockland to mitigate these impacts on the, uh, the power lines um, by setting up some sort of monitoring system or spatial analysis of the more vulnerable areas in Rockland County to tree fall. Um, and perhaps uh, in the future maybe use, using citizen monitoring in order to identify those vulnerable areas or an education or awareness program with regards to extreme events and the potential for tree fall in different areas in Rockland. And we could also use laser imaging uh, detection and ranging, which is essentially just remote sensing in the future when it becomes more um, easily accessible and a bit cheaper. Um, uh, on the scale of things, though, tree fall isn't really as much of a priority um, with regards to the mitigation steps that Rockland could take. It could just be essentially help with regards to the power outages in the future for extreme events like Sandy and Irene. Um, briefly, I'm going to talk about the social vulnerability. So another part of um, vulnerability to these weather events um, is not just the geographic location, um, but also the demographics of the population, how they can um, respond to these events. And what we found was that particularly income and age uh, impact a, a community's ability to respond to these events. Um, so in Stony Point and Haverstraw, um, of the communities along vulnerable to storm surge, um, this, was, this area was the most economically vulnerable, had the highest um, a percentage of the population below the poverty line. And so this means that uh, there would be difficulty in both um, preparing for these events and evacuating from them, as well as long-term recovery. Um, Piermont, which is another uh, community that was hit pretty hard by storm surge, was uh, less economically vulnerable, but had an older population. Um, and so in addressing uh, emergency preparation, it's important to keep that in mind. Yeah, another point to make is uh, in the aggregate, you can see the medium home values, the home ownership rate, income, uh, are above state averages by, by quite an amount. Um, but the individual poverty rate uh, is at 11.6%, 2.9% uh, above the statewide figures. Also, uh, property values grew 9.7% annually from 2002 to 2008, but have decreased uh, mostly due to the, the housing crisis. Um, but as we can see, there's a, in the aggregate, there's a high, you know, a value of, of, of um, citizen level, but uh, the distribution is fragmented across the county in, in certain individual pockets, as we'll see graphically. So this is a map showing percentage of the population below the poverty line, and as we can see, um, especially along here in Haverstraw and Stony Point, there's a high concentration of poverty in an area that's also geographically at risk for storm surge. And this is a population, percent of the population over 65. And we can see again that Piermont at the bottom of the screen um, is at higher risk in that regard. Um, so Rebecca and I worked on atmospheric climate projections for Rockland County, and we modeled our methods on ClimAid, which was a report made for New York State essentially projecting future climate change, climate change impacts, and making policy recommendations for mitigation and adaptation in the state. We worked with NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies in doing our projections, and we essentially projected temperature and precipitation, both mean projections and extreme projections. Um, we utilized a historical data as a baseline for our, our projections, 1970 to 1999, and we projected for three different time slices, the 2020s, which was re uh, requested by the client, and the 2050s and 2080s as well. 
And we started off doing the mean projections and then went into the extreme projections, utilizing the thresholds stated by Climate. And those thresholds were for hot days, mean max temperatures at or above 90 and 95 degrees Fahrenheit, cold days, minimum temperatures at or below 32 and 0 degrees Fahrenheit, and extreme precipitation over 1, 2, or 4 inches per day. So you can see on the graph here, um, we not only did projections for three different time slices, we also utilized three different uh, emission scenarios and 16 different climate models in our projections. So this graph is just basically demonstrating what climate, emi or, I'm sorry, emissions scenarios look like. And you can see there that uh, A2 are high emissions, A1B are middle emissions, and B1 are low emissions going into the three different time slices that we projected for. Um, so we first looked at mean projections to get an idea of the baseline of the future for what temperature and precipitation will be, and then also we can evaluate the extreme results um, compared to this. So the results you see here are across the three scenarios in the 16 climate models, the middle 67% of the data, so that's why you have a range. And so because these are the mean results, it's really our most um, reliable result. It's very difficult to make climate predictions. There's a lot of uncertainties. Um, so as you can see for temperature, there's a very likely increase. Um, and so it increased relative to the baseline and then through time as well. By the 2080s, it's a rather large increase of 4 to 8 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, precipitation, the results were a bit more ambiguous. Um, there is some potential decrease in precipitation, but it's quite small. Um, there's also, but there, what's really notable is there's a very strong potential for large increases in precipitation, um, and those also increase through time. Um, but in general, precipitation is more, um, there's more uncertainties. So we can see there's likely significant change for Rockland climate all year round, not only during extreme events. So what may be considered extreme now will not be considered extreme in the future. So that's something that also regarding the past events um, of, for example, um, Hurricane Sandy and Irene, that they have to keep in mind when doing just their planning um, is that the, these um, conditions will change. The 2050s projections matter for current infrastructure planning, and we also wanted to do 2080s projections, which are important for longer-term decisions. So then we looked at extreme, um, extreme, extreme results. So those are days that go above a certain threshold. So we don't know if those days are going to be in storms, if they're going to be just isolated events, or if they're going to be as part of a hurricane. It's just really days that go above this, um, this threshold. Um, we used a method that is a hybrid of daily and monthly projections. It's really difficult to make daily projections in the future. Um, so, um, and this is the same method as climate and we're happy to talk about it after. So we can see, this is for precipitation. So the first number is the minimum. It's again across all three scenarios in 16 models. The first number is the minimum, the last number is the maximum, and then the middle in brackets is the 67, middle 67% range of data. And um, so for precipitation, even though the mean results were um, a bit ambiguous, here there's really consistent increase. So we're pretty sure that they are going to have more extreme precipitation eventually which is important because of flooding. Um, and also, there's an increase through time in relative to the baseline. We then looked at cold days. And so this is consistent with, it's the same concept of minimum, middle range, and maximum. And um, we, it, it's consistent with the warming predictions and the mean results. There's going to be much fewer days of cold. So for example, they won't really have to uh, plan for any um, cold-related events. Um, but really, yeah, so, so those results are, are decreasing. We also found similarly that there will be a constant increase in extreme hot days in the future, so looking at probably more frequent and intense heat waves and drought as well, so that again reinforces the warming predictions. Okay. Um, so, um, so our extreme results, they reinforce our main conclusions. There's an increase in, in extreme precipitation. There's an increase in extreme hot days, but there's a decrease in cold days. Um, and the positive thing about our results is that they're really similar to the results in climate, so that makes us more confident that our results are correct. And also, um, we recommend that Rockland County can use all the conclusions that climate made. So just to clarify, climate is a report, it's exactly what we did, but for all of New York City, state and our report is unique in that it's much it's a much smaller scale it just looks at Rockland County but because the the results are very similar um, Clemmy made a lot of other conclusions for example on snow and on storms which we're not able to do and so we can say that they can um, with relative confidence apply those conclusions as well <laughs>
So generally, because we found that there will probably be a consistent increase in precipitation and hot days, um, Rockland can expect that there will probably be a higher frequency and intensity of flooding in the future, especially with regards to extreme events like Irene and Sandy. And given uh, external projections for sea level rise, this will probably mean increased inland and coastal flooding in the region as well. So we do recommend that um, Rockland continue to monitor and reassess these projections so that they can uh, ascertain whether or not these projections remain consistent and accurate and therefore make better and more accurate mitigation and adaptation planning in the short term and long term. Um, and additionally, they should probably take risk management strategies that would most likely involve going back over their uh, hazard mitigation plan and identifying those areas that, given these projections, would probably be a priority for the county to consider with regards to infrastructure planning. Okay. Hi. Um, so I will uh, start with an overview of the primary hydrological threats to Rockland County. And just to give a little bit of context by zooming out, um, Rockland was actually identified by um, recent uh, New York State flood risk report as one of the 17 counties most vulnerable to sea level rise. Um, so yeah, so it has particularly uh, yeah, it has particularly high vulnerabilities. And um, so Jesse already talked about what storm surge is. And so I'll focus on uh, storm surge as the primary driver of flooding, which is also the most damaging hazard of hurricanes, specifically for Rockland County. And um, sea level rise, which I'll talk about later in the presentation, is actually going to be more intense for the US northeastern coast, which is particularly um, relevant for Rockland due to the increase in frequency and intensity that it will, it will have bearing on coastal flooding. Okay. okay, so these are the primary factors which contribute to coastal flooding. Specifically, I look uh, mostly at hurricane both frequency and intensity, sea level rise, uh, sea surface temperature, and uh, wind, wind speed and precipitation. And storm surge is in the middle because it is the, uh, for Rockland, it is the uh, primary driver of coastal flooding, and which again is uh, a re demonstrated the damages via the uh, impact analysis from our and Sandy. Okay, so um, these these two different graphs um, demonstrate the relationship of two different factors. So the graph on the left is, is a theoretical model of the relationship between sea surface temperature and limiting, inten and limiting intensity of hurricanes. And the way they did both of these studies, they're two different studies, but they essentially they took the map of the Earth, um, particularly over the oceans, and they tessellated it into grids. And they, run, they, they, they would run multiple hurricane scenarios in each grid and looked at the intensity over different time intervals. And so the takeaway from both of these graphs is that the one on the left shows the correlation between the rise of sea surface temperature, which is demonstrated to increase, and of uh, the theoretical upper limit of the hurricane. And the graph on the right demonstrates the maximum the relationship between the maximum wind speed and the uh, storm surge levels for particularly uh, particular storm events. Okay, so um, we were not able to run any hydrological projections due to the time frame as well as data availability. But um, so in an extensive lit review of the scientific context of where we are with hydrological projections, um, primarily focused on studies for after 2009, um, I found that. Uh, there's wide agreement that hurricanes are likely to increase in intensity, meaning more, greater wind speeds, and, uh, more intense precipitation, and, and obviously both factors leading to uh, greater storm surge related flood risk. And, um, but as far as frequency, um, the global average is, the most recent study projects that global average will remain constant or decrease. However, um, with I, I'll demonstrate the um, more recent studies, uh, demonstrate there's gonna be regional variability. Um, so, right, uh, the, with all of the factors I mentioned in the circle, like uh, conceptual overview, there are uncertainties associated with each one of them, which are, uh, which are compounded in uncertainties. But as the, the main ones here are the inherent natural variability of tropical cyclones, so it's difficult a lot of times to link uh, hurricane behavior with climate change. And, um, and this is uh, the second one, which is a particular problem for Rockland, is the quality and the completeness of both cyclone surge and water level records, um, which makes any sort of projections and modeling extremely difficult on a regional level. And again, the impacts of climate change linking it to 
uh, specific de behavior demonstrations in storms. And also, um, the, by definition, extreme events are more rare, which makes the projections for extreme events a lot more difficult than, say, temperature or precipitation. So, um, the main, so the main takeaway from this slide that uh, for New York City, which is, this is, this is data from the, uh, the battery gauge, which is the closest one to Rockland. Um, essentially, flooding is gonna increase um, dramatically depending on if we're looking at uh, 2020, 2050, or, or the end of the century. And um, this actually doesn't include the rapid ice melt scenario, which is when ice melting accelerates around uh, the Greenland area. And so for reasons I uh, explained in the yeah, uncertainty slide, um, the current frequency, meaning from the, her like the frequency of storms between now and two, uh, 2020 is particularly difficult to assess. Yeah. I'll just skip right through this, but essentially a challenge we faced that there was there weren't wasn't a, a weather station, excuse me, in Rockland County. So we did make the recommendation that um, there could be a station installed or some sort of monitoring network, but that all comes down to funding essentially. Yeah, just to keep this in context, well, we'll look at quickly at the budget constraints. Um, deficits for the county keep growing, uh, property taxes um, rising while properties values are falling. Uh, the comptroller of the of the state uh, required that, that Rockland County need more long-term uh, planning to eliminate deficits and less reliance on non-recurring revenues. Uh, the bottom line takeaway here is sustainable development needs a sustainable budget. And uh, as far as their borrowing potential, it it it, um, it it signifies you know risk for future borrowing potential. Both S and P and and Moody's have have highlighted these concerns. Uh, Moody's even going further and and saying that uh, not only long term planning but unexpected uh, expenses related to Hurricane Sandy threaten threaten the uh, outlook of borrowing potential. And neither of these two discuss uh, long term vulnerability to climate and natural disasters as we highlight as a as a threat for the future. Um, so quickly, one of the recommendations that we found, given all this storm surge uh, information, was that um, planning, long-term planning, is very important so that uh, mitigation is in place. So that um, if you plan now for future events, uh, the cost will be much lower uh, for recovery uh, from those events. Uh, especially as Kathy pointed out, the um, flooding will be. Uh, increased frequency if there's sea level rise, as the climate projections uh, suggest. Uh, so just one, one recommendation which uh, arose out of our examination of the properties that have been damaged by flooding, and this primarily is true in the coastal areas. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of cases where homeowners may want to consider raising buildings uh, above the FEMA flood zones, which have recently been adjusted to be uh, more extensive than they were. Um, but currently, in a number of the towns, residential zoning would prevent people from raising their houses high enough uh, to be outside of the flood zone. And so one recommendation that we would make is that uh, towns should consider uh, providing variances or revising their zoning so that uh, properties in in the most vulnerable areas uh, can be raised out of the uh, out of the flood zone um, and just a, another note on this point um, I, I mentioned earlier that a couple uh, a couple houses uh, had to be demolished as a result of uh, the extensive damage they suffered during Hurricane Irene. And typically the way that process works is that uh, the owners have to apply to FEMA uh, for, for funds. Uh, and essentially what happens then is, is FEMA provides that money to the town government, uh, which then uses it to, uh, to buy out the property, demolish the structure, and leave it as a, as a natural vegetated buffer zone to increase resilience in future floods. So one recommendation we would make uh, would be to pursue more buyouts because they are one of the best ways to avoid damage. Uh, two other quick recommendations. One would be um, a number of the towns uh, in their master planning process so far haven't given much consideration to stormwater management. Um, and so that's definitely something that needs to be integrated as well as the climate projections that Rose and Rebecca talked about. 
Uh, and just a final point, uh, a, number of, uh, a number of public infrastructure, uh, types of public infrastructure such as roads, bridges, et cetera, uh, also need to be raised out of, uh, out of flood zones or otherwise flood proofed, although obviously that is subject to uh, the budget issues that Joe mentioned. Um, so going along with the recommendations on zoning, um, wetlands are also a way of ad adapting and mitigating for flooding, so we recommend the construction and rehabilitation of those. Another challenge, like highlighted before, is the, the borrowing potential is going to be severely limited in the future. So um, you need to increase revenues and address climate change and natural disaster concerns and through a, a, you know, a one policy. Uh, can adopt a policy like that in Philadelphia where they tax impervious services um, to uh, mitigate rainwater um, flooding. Uh, it will stimulate green infrastructure and local businesses, and you can target it uh, in appropriate areas, uh, attacks progressively among those who can afford it most, and target solutions appropriate to each threat, whether it's inland flooding or uh, storm surge. Oh, sorry. Okay, so essentially, um the pros of installing a weather station or similar climate monitoring network would be that there would be, uh, we would be able to eliminate variability, have a smaller scale analysis of events like Irene and Sandy. Um, given the, the climate projection implications made in this report, um, we can tell that this will be really important in the future since there will be a higher frequency and intensity of these types of extreme events. And it will be really key for mitigation um, that will be effective and efficient to know um, to have this sort of small scale, more t a higher spatial and temporal resolution weather data information. Again, as Joe mentioned, the cost and the funding would be an issue, so Rockland would have to consider what the funding source for that would be. Um, and in order to reduce the cost, they could focus on more site-specific measurement tools, such as stream gauges or anometers, which uh, measure wind, um, and perhaps maintain or rehabilitate existing infrastructure, such as stream gauges that are currently inactive but could become active. Um, so there's currently a number of really exciting projects and innovations within hydrological projections, and specifically there's going to be, there's going to be a, a number of uh, national and regional web-based platforms for coastal managers as well as the uh, average citizen or uh, consumer. And in evaluating a number of regional and uh, national flood risk maps and flood risk projections and studies, um, Rockland was often omitted as a region. Um, and this is uh, for... Uh, two primary reasons. Number one, um, the, uh, a slosh model, which can, uh, which stands for sea, lake, and overland surges from hurricanes, which can, uh, which is used to estimate storm surge heights, and it can use historical data or hi hypothetical or projected data. Currently, there are no slosh models for Rockland, only metropolitan New York City. So we're recommending that they uh, run their own slosh model. And additionally. Um, with the one of the um, more exciting platforms, the NOAA Digital Coast, um, also excludes Rockland, and this is because uh, this is in part because they have not made their uh, lidar-based elevation data and uh, digital elevation models available for these large-scale uh, web platforms or studies, um, which is why they're often or omitted in these really important risk management projections. And um, the final recommendation is that. Um, currently, there's only one uh, gauge on the Hudson within Rockland County that's active, and that's uh, Piermont. And so we're gonna uh, we're gonna make a recommendation that Haverstraw they reopen the tie gauge because um, yeah. So this is just gonna provide more data. This is like a long-term investment of gathering more data so they can make uh, more regionalized projections. That's gonna have a profound in, in, like implications for for policy and, and zoning and some of the other recommendations that we've already talked about. Okay, so um, with that, that's the conclusion of the presentation and the recommendations. Um, we will all be here to take questions. I have a question. So I'm, uh, I'm both scientifically scientifically interested, um, but also a resident of Rockland County. I live in Nyack, so a lot of those pictures uh, 
we're awfully close to home. My question uh, initially is for Rebecca and Rose regarding the climate projections. And I'm wondering, is there any good news in here at all when you, uh, did you look at the individual CO2 scenarios from the, the business as usual up to the, the high uh, CO2 levels? If we mitigate through CO2 uh, reductions, is there any good news in there for Rockland? We didn't, we didn't look at the, sorry, we just mixed up all the results to get that range, so we didn't look at the individual scenarios. Um, there is, we can look into that, sorry, we, didn't, we just wanted to get that table. But um, there, I mean, we can look at the different ones. I think just re remembering the results, it was a little bit lower, uh, definitely for temperature. But in any case, even with the lowest, there's still going to be an increase. And I mean, as you know, climate projection is a very uncertain and it's very difficult to to say, but we're pretty confident even with the lowest. This. But the good news is it's going to be less cold. So. <laughs> <laughs> I like this one. Oh, sorry, that's not too. Well, I, I do have another question. Oh, no, Someone else does. <laughs> Jason. <laughs> <laughs> So you guys motivated a lot of your presentation based on the impacts of hurricanes, Irene and Sandy. And then when you talked about the projections, there's a difference there in terms of the extreme events that you're talking about in the model projections and what you can actually say about hurricanes into the future. We can certainly do that, but it's not as easy to do into the future through projections. Do you think it's fair to compare them in, in the way that you did in the, in the sense that a lot of the impacts, for instance, storm surges associated with hurricanes are not something that is um, necessarily the product of the extreme events that you're looking at in uh, the projections. So how, how, how do you feel about those two comparisons and what you can say about them in the projections? Um, so one of the things is, um, I think as far as the actual like frequency and intensity of hurricanes, I think that's probably the stuff that we can say with like the some of the least certainty. Um, what the, the, as far as the frequency of, one of the things I think um, we didn't quite hit on it as in depth as, as, as probably we will with the client is um, the frequency of like the 100 year flood and of like, and other flood scenarios that they, that they have set, that they use for like FEMA and other things. Um, and a lot of those projections on, on an increasing is just based on sea level rise um, and not, and so they assume that you're having the historical um, you know, frequency being, you know, the same. Um, and so, I mean, obviously it could be less, it could be more, um, or in, in, as far as intensity too. But um, as far as, if you have that, those same events happening um, with a greater sea level rise, this is how many more times you're gonna have that per year. You know, the 100 year flood, once the one in 100 year um, flood is gonna become a, you know, three in 100 year, um, you know, by, I, I forget the actual, um, if it's mid-century or, um, I think it's by mid-century, though. But, yeah, I mean, so that's the kind of issue there. Kathy, is there anything else on that? Um, yeah, I mean, there's just two projections that didn't make into this version of the presentation, but um, the, the most recent and comprehensive studies that look at all the different factors, including uh, storm surge levels, global temperature, and sea level rise, uh, all point to shorter return periods for storms um, both globally and also in the Atlantic in particular, because it is disproportionately affected by both sea level rise and uh, temperature increase. Um, and I think also the reason that we talked so much about Sandy and Irene before talking about the projections is just um, because it gives some context of what potentially could happen. So even though it won't necessarily be part of a hurricane, there's going to be more flooding. And this is a recent example of what happened when there was a lot of flooding. Yeah, I think, I mean, when you talk to a client, I think it's really important that you separate some things. We can really talk about vulnerabilities, things like sea level rise, increases. We know storms are going to get stronger. Um, but in terms of the number of hurricanes that we expect to get to this region, that's a much more difficult projection to make. Mm -hmm. And to, I, I don't think you want to conflate the two things that you're looking at. One is the occurrence of hurricanes in this area. The other is the extreme precipitation events that we know are going to occur just through circulation changes atmosphere and so on. So it's really important to try to keep those two things separate and make sure you can tell the client specifically what we know, which is, for instance, with hurricanes, vulnerability is increasing, likelihood of more extreme storms increasing, but it's very hard to say that this area is going to receive a significant higher number of storms, etc. With regard to hurricanes. So 
<laughs> My second question, uh, several of you commented on monitoring and the lack of a weather station uh, or any climate monitoring in Rockland County. And I, I've been working for quite some time to try and understand how ecosystems are responding from New York City north towards the Catskills. So I've suffered this myself many times looking for climate data, which just doesn't exist. The closest thing is the other side of the river, right? So um, I'm wondering with your with your uh, recommendations, if you think that it's reasonable to uh, bring Columbia into this at all, or is that a conflict of interest? In the sense that Columbia University has a large presence in Rockland County. It's on the very southern edge of Rockland County, but there's many scientists there interested in, in the climate. And in fact, in fact, on, on the uh, property, Lamont's property, there is a stream that runs into the Hudson. So stream gauges, uh, temperature monitoring, uh, uh, climate monitoring or weather monitoring are all things that scientists at Lamont are interested in. I know I am. And maybe a partnership is something that should be pursued. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. So there is um, one of the things like, yeah, there's actually, they've had, they had just put like a stream gauge or a, or a tide gauge in, at Piermont. And then it's getting closed because I think budget cuts or um, I don't know if it's part of the sequester or what. Um, but yeah, it, I think we actually did talk about, um, with the fact that you have Lamont there, so I'm sure you have many sci scientists like yourself who live in the county. Um, and maybe and one of the things I think we're going to address the client is maybe building a network, maybe with schools, uh, maybe, maybe if there's some you know, local groups of these scientists that they're forming um, that could you know, par participate in, um, in having you know, these monitoring. It's kind of like Weather Underground, and I know there's a few of those. Um, in the county, but kind of making sure that they're stable, they're reliable sources. Because even if it's not a, a you know national weather station, um, I don't we we don't know the costs on that, for example. So we don't know exactly how realistic that is. But it, you know that's something that you know is having being able to have the network of more local things like anemometers and stream gauges. I think is a big thing that you touched on. So anything else on that or? No, I, think, I mean, we, we did initially discuss the, the partnership with Lamont, um, but we didn't really get into that as much um, just because we weren't entirely sure what the feasibility was there. Um, but as, I mean, Rob touched on it, just because there are so many people who are working at Lamont and scientists like yourself who are living in the area and interested, um, New York City itself does have this kind of climate monitoring network that essentially installs different monitoring tools on schools and community buildings, um, and that seems a little bit more feasible given the budget cuts and constraints in Rockland um, for, for them to input to, to gain sort of more lo local site-specific data. So. Hi, I just wanted to know how the, um, you have those extreme precipitation projections, and I wanted to know how that related to the precipitation in Irene, because you talk about that over a several day period, but you were projecting, you know, two inches in one day, whatever, whatever the projections you were making. How much were you projections? No, I thought you were talking about. No, 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 it was the extreme precipitation event projections. Well, so, uh, the, the, the data, we, we have a couple things. I mean, we, we can look at how much precipitation there was, uh, you know, just on the day of the hurricane, but I, I think that's not necessarily the most pertinent number because uh, certainly in the case of Irene, there was precipitation in the whole week leading up to that, which obviously played a big role in determining, you know, the, uh, how much water there was in the streams and how much flood, flooding damage occurred. So definitely there, there is yeah, sort I of a... Whichever way the number, whatever it turned out, was yeah, no, absolutely, and, and right, and I, I didn't work with projections, but certainly I, you know, I think it, it is important to look at sort of a, a multi-day period leading up to the storm. Yeah, I mean, it's I think it's precipitation. I think is a tough one, tough one, especially for like inland flooding because it, you know, you have a huge river basin and uh, our. Or, flood, or hydrological basin and things like that. But is there anything else that you guys? I mean, it just think goes of? back to the point Jason made is really di like the distinction between um, the extreme precipitations, just looking at historical data, and then seeing how much that will increase. And then hurricanes and storms are really hard to predict. But um, I mean, I think the our projections just show that there's going to be more days with a lot of rain. Um, 
I, we didn't like predict that there's going to be a certain number of days with um, precipitation as high as, as Sandy Irene. But um, yeah, because for example, the four inch one was less than a day per year. But it's just that there's going to be, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's the same really tricky distinction between um, storms and extreme days. up just by saying thanks a, a really impressive presentation great work and and really interesting stuff and uh, luckily I don't have to raise my house but maybe I'll I'll buy short sleeve shirts from now on um, I, uh, the other the last thing I want to say is that there's three more presentations from the capstone workshop happening on Monday so uh, we have three other teams of students who have done equally as interesting work and they'll be presenting at to one o'clock in this room on Monday. So uh, we welcome anyone to come back and hear more about it. And again, thanks you guys, just terrific stuff.